Kindness. We see it all around us. We see it when someone pays for someone else's coffee or holds the door open for another person. We see it in the smallest of gestures, like a smile or a kind word. But it's different when we turn on the news or social media. Oftentimes, what we hear about, what outlets are pushing, is the opposite of kind. Welcome to the Kindness Matters Podcast. Our goal is to give you a place to relax, to revel in stories of people who have received or given kindness, a place to inspire and motivate each and every one of us to practice kindness every day. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Kindness Matters Podcast. I am your host, Mike Rathbun. Um, I have been wanting to do this show for a while now. Um, As someone who has written a book about and hosts a podcast about kindness, someone who has written a book about what it takes to be happier, as an American, I look around at the political landscape today and honestly, it makes me sad to see us like this. What do I mean by like this? I mean divided. There's been a talk about how we as Americans have not been this divided since the Civil War. Maybe. In my lifetime, the only thing that comes this close is probably during the Vietnam War. Starting in the 60s and running through until the mid-70s, we Americans were plenty divided. Demonstrations were everywhere, in small towns and big cities. On May 4, 1970, members of the Ohio National Guard were dispatched to the campus of Kent State University, to break up a group of college students protesting against the war. When it was over, four students were killed and another eight were injured. Much like the Republican Party of today, the Democratic Party was bitterly divided by the Vietnam War. On one side, there were those in the party who wanted to continue with the war as a stopgap to communism in Asia. They were represented by Vice President Hubert Humphrey. President Lyndon Johnson, struggling with dissent in his own party over the war, announced on March 31, 1968, that he would not seek re-election. On the other side of the party, there was an anti-war faction led by Senator Eugene McCarthy of Minnesota and Robert Kennedy of New York. When Kennedy was assassinated in June of 1968, the Democratic Party fell into turmoil. Yet, despite this, The mid-20th century in American politics was marked by unique levels of bipartisanship in lawmaking. That all began to change in the 80s and the 90s. In 1994, Republicans won their first majority in the House of Representatives in nearly 40 years. They were led by a congressman from Georgia named Newt Gingrich. Gingrich upended what had been a standing system for Republicans to go along to get along. Basically, Republicans accepted their minority status in the hopes of getting some crumbs from the majority party for their districts. Gingrich had other plans. He relentlessly went on the offensive against Democrats attacking them. Indeed, he trained a generation of candidates how to do it too. His political action committee, GOPAC, created a vocabulary of good words to describe Republican policy ideas such as liberty, freedom, truth, and opportunity, alternatively using bad words to describe Democratic policies such as decay, corrupt, permissive, and pathetic. Although he only lasted in the House for four years, Gingrich had a particular knack for knowing how to get his message out. He realized that the media could not turn away from covering conflict. Hence, making noise became a premium job skill for every politician and candidate. The more noise you made, the bigger your exposure from media. Speaking of vocabulary, let's talk about dehumanization. It is the denial of full humanity in others. A practical definition refers to it as the viewing and the treatment of other people as though they lack the mental capacities that are commonly attributed to human beings. Alexander Theodoridis 
who teaches political science at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, says that today's partisanship can lend itself to particularly dehumanizing language, not only between political opponents, but also between regular Americans who belong to opposite political parties. In an enlightening interview with NPR in October of 2020, which I've linked to the show notes, he says that dehumanizing language can lead to people believing that those who disagree with them don't deserve the same treatment or respect as those who agree with them. And from there, it becomes a problem. When it is normalized, as it seems to be given the frequency we're seeing, it becomes a slippery slope. During the era of the Nazi party in Germany, Jewish people were commonly referred to as vermin. During the Rwandan genocide in 1994, the ruling Hutu party told followers that members of the minority Tutsi population were, quote, cockroaches who should go back to Ethiopia, unquote, the birthplace of the movement. Have you ever heard someone in America say that members of a particular group should go back to where they came from? You see, when we tend to think of others, whether it's homeless people, refugees, or immigrants, or even members who belong to a political party different from our own, as less than human, it becomes easier to accept or promote violence against that group. In a study done just prior to the 2020 election, Alexander Landry asked members of each political party to rate how they viewed members of the opposite party on a scale from 0 to 100 based on the famous evolution of man image. You know the one. It depicts a silhouette of an ape on one end of the scale and progresses through the evolution of man until it reaches modern man. That's the one. In the study... Two out of every three Americans rated members of the opposing party as less human than members of their own party, and it wasn't even close. American partisans rated members of the opposing party, on average, a 42 on a scale of 0 to 100. Dr. Landry reasoned that it would be important to find out if partisans perceived that the other party dehumanized them as well. So he asked Democrats and Republicans how they thought the other side rated them on the evolution of man scale. Partisans greatly overestimated how much the other side dehumanized them. On average, both sides thought the other dehumanized them more than twice as much as they actually did. And here's where things get sticky. Because if one group thinks that they are being dehumanized by the other side, they tend to want to fight back against that. According to Mr. Landry, quote, Partisans who dehumanized the other side were more likely to support using anti-democratic means to hurt them, agreeing with statements like, for Republicans, Trump should use force to stay in power if the election results seem fraudulent, and, for Democrats, the Democrats should do everything they can to hurt the Republicans, even if it is at the short-term expense of the country, unquote. And that, friends, is where we find ourselves today. Does it look bleak? Yes. Do we have to accept this as the new normal? Absolutely not. There are things that you and I can do to resist dehumanization and polarization in this country. For example, if your political candidate of choice uses dehumanizing speech, such as painting others as evil or a detriment to society, as not belonging to your group? Call them out on it. Demand that he or she be better. Perhaps consider threatening to withhold your vote if the action continues. Granted, that's a long shot, especially if the politician is getting traction and seeing their polling numbers go up after such a speech or a tweet. But we know that politicians respond to numbers, and if enough of us refuse to support candidates who engage in dehumanization talk, or who try to scare us by telling us that X candidate is going to take away our Y if they're elected, perhaps, just perhaps, we can change the system. Now, you might be thinking, well, that's great, but what am I supposed to do as one person? I can write an email or four, but that's not going to change anything. And you're probably right. 
one person alone has never accomplished much. That's one of the keys to changing our current path. After the pandemic, we became more isolated. First, because we needed to, to keep others safe. But then, it was like we enjoyed it. Rates of loneliness have soared since the pandemic. The way to cripple political partisanship and dehumanization is to re-engage with other humans. Partisanship thrives when we are alone in our own information bubble. We read, we listen to, we consume only those views we agree with. Sadly, those views are telling us that immigrants are coming to take our jobs or a certain religious group is trying to force their beliefs on us or those who don't love like we do are destroying our society, our country. The only way to break out of this spiral is to put yourself out there. Go to a festival celebrating a culture different from yours. Go to an ethnic restaurant and speak to the owners. Listen to their stories. Ask questions. Volunteer at a food shelf and speak to the people that use it. That person you, who you may have thought was just a lazy soul sponging off of your tax dollars has so much more in common with you than you realized. They're married and have kids just like you. They're just trying to get by just like you. Of course, they're American just like you. Your neighbor who had a yard sign advertising a candidate you didn't support is just like you. He or she has a spouse, kids, maybe grandkids. They go to work. They come home just like you. They mow their lawn on the weekends just like you. Go to a church festival and speak with the congregants. You'll find that even though they worship differently, they are good, caring people who want the same things as you do, safety, security, a better life for their children than they had, just like you. Our politicians, our media, and our friends want us to believe that there are people in this country who are different than we are, and thus we should be suspicious of them, fear them, maybe even hurt them. Don't listen to them. If we want to make this country better than it is, we, and that means each and every one of us, has to say in one voice, enough. I will be kinder today than yesterday. I will not judge another person. I will treat someone else the same way I want to be treated. And then, and only then, will we be a better country. Thank you for your time in listening to this episode of the Kindness Matters podcast. Uh, You should probably know that I reached out to several politicians, uh, both national and here in my state, and nobody really wanted to come on. I don't know why. So that's why you had only me today. Uh, You have been listening to the Kindness Matters podcast. I am your host, Mike Rathbun. Thank you for listening. We'll be back again next week. But in the meantime, be that person who roots for others, who tells a stranger they look amazing, and encourages others to believe in themselves and their dreams. I'm Mike Rathbun, your host. Have a fantastic week.